Welcome to talks by members of the Survey and Cartography section of the National Speleological Society. These videos are intended to be how-to videos on cave survey software and other programs used by cavers in the exploration and documentation of the world beneath our feet. All right, with that, I am going to introduce our speaker for tonight, Pat Cambesis at Western Kentucky University in CRF and uh, generally caving circles near and far. Um, Pat has a lot of experience with Compass and GIS, and tonight she's going to be talking about an overview and introduction to Compass. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Pat. Okay, so as Aaron said, this is an overview. It's not like a tutorial. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of go over um, some of the basic principles of using Compass. And then I'll probably just real quick talk about some of the more advanced features, which could use its very own other presentation. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of cool things that you can actually do with Compass. But first things first, Compass is um, the software developer for it is Larry Fish. And um, just as with David McKenzie, Larry Fish has been supporting his program for like over 30 years. And so, and he continues to support it. Um, so he regularly updates it. I have on the side of the screen there, I show his, his website and I also have his um, um, URL for that. And so he, he uh, provides a lot, of, a lot of really good support. He's got online help. He also has tutorials. Um, and so his page in and of itself is also a really good resource for, for Compass. And it looks like the latest update that he did was just like in May of this year. So it's still an ongoing and active um, project for him. Um, Compass is free. You can just download it for free. However, if you want, you know, some um, more, you know, heavy support, I think he charges like 50 bucks one time fee to become like a lifetime, you know, member or however you want to call it. And then you can call him up and if you have a problem or if you want something special, he'll do it for you. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, and I think that's reasonable because, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to do this. So anyway, um, there's bunches of different software uh, packages out there to, to deal with your cave survey data. And Compass does, you know, all of the same things that just about everybody else does, probably maybe slightly differently, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to show. But, you know, what it has, and the thing I like about it is I like its user interface because I think it's really friendly. If you're very new to data entry, um, something like, like, you know, and I'm not criticizing any programs, I'm just comparing them. Like walls, the data entry is not quite as, as intuitive, but once you get it, you know, it's like fine. So for a beginner, this is kind of a, a, a good way to start. Um, it just as with other software programs, it's going to check the quality of your survey data. But keep in mind that it doesn't fix the quality of your survey data. I mean, if you've made a typo or you accidentally did some tie-ins wrong or, you know, something like that, then it's going to help you find those errors. However, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make your data better. It's not magic to make your data better. Sometimes you just have to go back in the cave and redo it. Um, it will make a line plot in, in uh, many different formats that could be imported into various drawing programs and to other applications as well. One of the things I really like about it is its data visualization. Um, uh, it's it's uh, for cartography, I'll usually pull up the, um, the 3D little model that I could make with this and it helps me understand where, you know, how to draw my profiles. And so my, you know, my uh, philosophy is if you don't understand it, you can't draw it. Just like with sketching, if you don't know what you're looking at, it's hard for you to draw it. It will export KML files for use in Google Earth Pro. And of course, a lot of people already do that. And that's really handy and helpful because um, Google Earth Pro is really easy to use. And so you could zap out some line plots to, you know, help with your exploration. It um, exports shape files for GIS applications, which is, you know, something that I really like. Um, and don't be intimidated by GIS. You know, it sounds kind of scary, but it's, it can do a lot of really cool things. And it's getting less complicated as they make things a little bit more user friendly. And Compass also has a pretty extensive suite of other applications um, that are associated with it. And so there's a bunch of other things that you could do with, with that whole suite of Compass software. 
So what I want to go over really quick is something about the compass files, because, you know, you're going to look at your files and you're going to be like, well, what, what do all these things mean? So the basic data file in compass is, is uh, whatever the name is dot dat, and that's just a data file. So when you enter data, that's where it goes. Um, you'll see a, a dot bak file, and that is just a backup of your data file. So it automatically makes a backup as you're entering data. Uh, once you do any loop closures, then it makes a CLP file, and that's you know that's just uh, the changes that Compass made um, in order to you know for your loop closures. The PLT is also is the plot file, and you can do a lot more with the plot file than just look at the plot. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's also something called the make file or a Mac file, but a make file. And a make file is just it's just a project file. It's analogous to say the project file that that Walls has. Okay, so um, I, I'm not as familiar with the uh, format of the Walls files, but you know this is Compass and they're pretty easy. Um, the data files are just uh, text files. So you can do other things with them too. And so I found, found that to be really helpful. Now, you're like, well, what's the difference between having the data file and the project file? What's the big deal? Why do you even have those? Well, the reason you have them is because the data file is, that's all, all that is, is you enter your data in it and it usually contains a bunch of surveys for one cave, okay? They all have to be, all the surveys have to be tie-in connected. You can't have surveys that are not um, physically connected because they will not plot. Um, you can do, you can put multiple caves in a, in a DAT file, but they have to be connected by a surface survey. So a DAT file alone is not geo-referenced. And I have some, uh, an example there where I show, um, if you look on the left-hand side, um, I have some data there. I can't, oh, it's for, for a cave in Haiti. And that is just um, a, da a data file. And that's an example of what your, your printout or what your list is going to look like for um, if you're just doing a single data file. Um, a make file contains one or more data files. If you want to geo-reference your data file, you have to pull it into, you have to make it a make file. And making a make file is extremely easy, just like making any kind of file is actually pretty simple and I'll, I'll go over that too. So just to start out, and this will be like probably the last slide that I go to until the end because I kind of want to show live things that you could do with Compass. Um, when you, it's going to give you an icon like you see on my screen there, the project manager, and um, when you click on that, if you don't have any data in there, this is what it brings up. And it's a pretty simple and nicely organized little screen. Um, there's the blank space is where all of your data files will show up. Um, you've got a, a file for editing your, or excuse me, you have a button for editing your data. You have one for processing and viewing all of the data, or you can process and view some of the data. Now, if you have all of your data in one DAT file, then you're not going to be able to pick out which areas specifically that you want to look at. But if you have it as a make file, then you can look at the different parts of the make file. So there's a lot of advantages to working in a make file. Uh, I would always work in a make file. Um, the bottom of the screen, once you process your data, is going to list if there's any compilation errors, if there's any breaks in the survey, if there's some reason or some problem with the survey, or with the, the compilation, you'll see it in the bottom screen. And then in the top, you have a whole series of little buttons and icons. And I'm going to go through some of those because that's kind of what you need to, um, to work in Compass. So let me bring up a live Compass file. First, I'm going to bring up a DAT file. And the example that I'm using is, is directly from um, the example that Fish has in his, in his uh, software. Um, so if anybody were to look at that, you know, you'd have the identical same thing to look at. So when I highlight it, well, before I highlight it, let me kind of go through some of this stuff across here. Um, so we're not seeing that yet, Pat. We see your PowerPoint still. Really? 
So it's going to make me jump out and jump in. So do I need to unshare and then share again? No, no. You should be able to drag. Are you using dual monitor? No. Dual monitor. Uh, um, I'm going to have to unshare and then share again. That could be. Sorry. That's okay. So, okay. Just bear with me while I do that. Okay, so this is what, can everybody see this? Aaron? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so this is what your typical DAT file is going to look like. And I'll show you how to make these in just a minute. So across the top, if you, just like with any other software, when you run your cursor across the top, it tells you basically what each one of these little um, applications do on that ribbon. And so this is where you would start a, date, a DAT file or create a project file. It's all pretty easy and self-explanatory. Um, this is some editing that you can do, add files to your project, take files out of your project. One thing that's important is this thing called edit file node. And notice it's grayed out in the, in the um, DAT file because this is where you're gonna put the information to geo-reference your, to, in other words, to make your data um, related to what's, you know, on the surface. And so that's why, you know, you can't use this in, in this version. Um, your view is where you're going to see the cave statistics. And I'll show you examples of some cave statistics. I'm going to run this file in a little bit, such as the depth of the cave, the length of the cave. It gives you how many shots, volume. It has a whole bunch of different um, uh, data that it will give you, and I will show that. And then, of course, blunders and we're, you know, we all know about trying to find blunders. And I'm not really going to go into depth about how to find blunders, but I just want you to know that there is no button that you press that tells you where the error is on your survey. You have to go find it. And blunders, just as in other software, it helps you, it gives you tools to help you find the blunder, but it doesn't exactly find it for you. So it's kind of a, you know, an art even in a way, finding blunders. Run, I never used this. At one time when uh, Compass was first, um, you know, being used, all of its pieces were like separate little applications before he kind of married them all into this nice user face. Options, options, this is where you have a lot of settings that you have control over. And pretty much you can see like there's, you know, it, um, they say uncertainty settings, okay? How much error do you want to allow in your compass, in your clinometer, in your tape? Are you surveying in US fleet or international fleet? There's a difference. Your units, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. You can you know, toggle on and off the things that you want to do. Uh, let's see. Close options, this is if you're gonna, if you're doing your um, um, loop closure. And these are various options that you could do loop closure. You can look at loop closure in terms of, you know, a percent error or an absolute error or a standard deviation. It's up to you. It's the, whatever you choose. I noticed at Carlsbad Caverns, at least the last time I looked, when they were processing their data, they were using standard deviation as opposed to um, percent error, which is, you know, what other people have used. Um, I won't really talk. But a lot of this stuff is a little bit esoteric that is in especially if you're just going to start using it you probably won't worry about them too much i will talk a little bit about these um shot flags in a little bit and so if you see things that you um, want to know something about make a note of it and i'll try to um you know answer at the end of the lecture the program is pretty deep it has you know it has a lot of different things that it will do and so i'm just trying to show you the most basic things um, this, for tools, this is where you can either export an SEF or import an SEF. And you're like, what is an SEF? It's a survey exchange format. And um, in the days of um, SMAPS, I don't know, some of you probably remember SMAPS, um, that's how you could export data in SMAPS because the author of SMAPS was very proprietary about his data and he didn't really want to make you know his application if you wanted to use his program he didn't want you to be exporting data easily out of it but he did make the sef and so you can export data from compass and import it into walls and vice versa using that sef format 
You can also, CMAP is another software package, and then of course there's Pocket Topo. Um, if people wanted other things, you know, I'm sure you could ask Larry and see if he'd be willing to make some other conversions. Kind of up to, you know, you and him, whatever. And then we have a geographic calculator, which I will go into more when I, you know, in a, in a, when I'm talking more about the data entry. And basically that's to figure out your um, magnetic declination, which your magnetic declination is changing all the time. So depending on where you are, um, you're going to definitely want to take that into account. For long-term projects, you definitely have to take into account the change of magnetic declination. Otherwise, you're going to have issues with, with your data closing. And then, of course, help. He has a little help tab with every screen that comes up. So if you don't understand something or you want to know more about it, um, there's always a little help that, that's right there on your screen that's really helpful for you. Know, for you. Um, these are just, you know, just icons of different things that you could do. When they say expand or collapse the tree, they're talking about this. And in the DAT format, there is no tree. Not really. You can't see it here. Um, when you look at the data, you can, but not here. And if you just run your cursor, you know, create new file. These are shortcuts to things that you could do in other places. And so there's a couple of different, you know, options or ways to look at things. Um, I am going to, let's see if it will let me do the make file or if it's going to make me share my, can you see that? Can you see the, the make file? We Eric? see. Does it say fulford.mac or dot dat? It says dot dat. Okay, so I'm going to have to unshare it. And this is the last time I'll do this. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now can you see the make file? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so when they talk about this survey tree, this is what they're talking about. So basically a make file is just a container. And within that container, you can put other files. And so um, you could have five or six different caves in here. They don't all have to be connected, but they have to have some kind of a geographic reference. And so if we look at this Fulford dat file, and we go to edit file node. At station A1, that's the coordinates for station A1. And that establishes where that, you know, where this cave is. This is all surface survey. So, you know, at one time, at least when I was first drawing maps of caves, I didn't think too much about georeferencing stuff because we didn't have real easy ways to do it. You know, you just took a transparency and you put it on the topo map and that's how you georeferenced it. And so now that we have so many different ways that you could get that information, it to me become really, really important. So how do you how do you make how do you add data? And it's pretty simple. You go to file and it says create new survey file. So you create the new survey file. And you're gonna give the survey and your what you are is you're giving the survey a name. And I like to name my survey files after the survey that you know that it's that it's going to contain so just for grins i'm going to put an a in there and then the next thing it's going to do is it's going to ask me well what is the actual file name or what maybe cave or whatever so i might put a data file within a file that's got five or six other different data files in it so um i might call this i don't know i could call it another cave um, secret cave or something. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to um, mess up the data processing that I'm going to show you here in a little bit. But so once you make your file, your dat file, um, you could make it from within the project and then it automatically puts it in there or you could make it a dat file and then you can import it. You see where it says insert new file, insert existing file, that's what that means is the file that you made now you can now bring it into the project and that's the thing that initially confuses people is well I can't georeference my data what's wrong it's because it's not in a make file um, so anyway so let's look a little bit and see what this data looks like all right so in this case that file that was called Fulford 
contains all these different surveys. Okay. And you can see it's got the survey name and then it's got the survey date. And when you enter your data, you want to make sure that you enter it the day that, you know, the cave was surveyed, not the day that you entered the data. You know, think about magnetic declination. You want, you know, that's when you want the, the um, date to be in there. And all these are different parts of the cave. And I like the cave to be identified by a name of something. I think we're stuck on an image again. That, what? We are still seeing the basic make, make file page. Really? Okay. I'm sorry. I guess I'm going to have to. So is so Aaron, when I go switch to different applications, I have to share and unshare every time? You shouldn't have to on anything from the Zoom side. I'm not sure what might be going on with your laptop. Can you not alt tab to the different? Are you sharing an application or sharing your screen? I'm showing my, it, well, actually I'm showing an application on my screen. No, what, what are you sharing though, Pat? You should be sharing your desktop not an yeah. application. Okay, so yeah. So share, share your monitor, not the application, and you should be able to go back and forth easily. Okay. Can you see um, a survey list right now? No, we're still seeing your application. So you might have to stop the sharing okay. and then go do share screen and then share your whole monitor screen, and then you'll be able to go back to your app. Okay, like this. So now I just shared the whole screen. Can you see? Yep. Now we see it all. Yep. Okay. That's good. All right. So basically what I was saying is, is that I like to name things because if you tell me it's the CGH survey, I don't have, you know, that doesn't mean anything to me, especially when you have a long, complicated cave. So I guess I'm throwing in cave survey philosophy in, <laughs> in addition to, you know, all this other stuff. So when you enter data, when you enter a new file, what it's going to do is, and, and what I did was I went to um, select survey. I'm not going to select a new survey I'm going to because I want you to see what's in existing surveys. So what you would do when you entered, when you brought up a blank screen like this, is you would put the cave name in, a name in there, your survey name, whatever kind of comment that you want to make about it. There's where your survey date goes. You always want to put in the survey team. Uh, the declination, you won't know off the top of your head, but you can use the calculate declination and it will calculate it for you. Um, let's see if I can do that. Now I'm afraid to get out of there. Can you see that? Can you see the geo calculator? Yep. Yes. Okay. okay, cool. So basically this is where you would put the GPS location of say, you know, your cave. And then what it will do is it will calculate, um, it will calculate uh, um, a, a declination for you. So in this particular file, it says the declination is this, okay? If you have any corrections, this is where you would put all those. Um, anyway, the metadata, you know, this is like, why do I have to enter all this data? I just want my cave data. Well, actually you want all of this data because especially if you're gonna have a long-term project with lots of survey going on, the, the metadata, the data about the data becomes really important in terms of the history of what you're doing, in terms of who did what. Um, there's many good reasons why you need to do a really good job of filling out this metadata kind of stuff. So once you have that all filled out, then what you need to do is you need to um, format this guy. Okay, so this is where you're going to enter all your data. And you have control over how you want to format that in this area here. So if I want to um, edit my settings, then I would click edit settings. And then what it does is it lets me determine the order in which I want to put my data in there. If I want to have, if I want to record the uh, backside, I can record it. Um, if I don't, I don't have to. And all you do is highlight it and use this arrow to take it wherever you want. Okay. So it's pretty simple. And the same thing with the passage dimensions. I always like mine to be left, right, up, down, but it could be any way that you want. And that kind of lets you do that. Um, in this part, you, you have the option of enabling backsites. If you enable backsites, then you have to make sure that you 
put back sites in, in your readings. I think there's a way to allow you to not put one in there, but I don't remember what it is. But you want to be cognizant of this if you added back sites. And then you can determine, do you want passage dimensions to start at your very first station, or do you want it to start at the, the next station, like at the two station? And the thing with this is, is um, that regardless of where you start, you're going to have some station at the end or at the beginning that you don't have a passage dimension that, that matches it. And how do you deal with that? Well, what a lot of people do is they put in a dummy shot. So say, for instance, I wanted my last, I want to read all of my stations from, or I want to start at the two station. Then when I get to my very last station, what I would do is I would put in a dummy station. I'd give it like a distance of, you know, 0 0.001, so it really has no distance. And then I, it doesn't matter what you put in for the, for the, uh, the compass because my inclination is going to be minus 90 or plus 90. And that way you can include your passage dimensions in there. Um, compass will plot out the location of your passage dimensions, which is why you know, it's kind of important for you to indicate where you want them. You also want to be real cognizant of your units. We're always going to be, in the U.S., we always use compass degrees. Okay, So we don't really vary from this too much. Um, if you're a cave diver, you're going to probably use depth gauge instead of inclination. You want to make sure that the, the data that you have, that if you have data in meters, make sure that this is in meters. Because if you change it, you know, you may have entered it in meters, but it's really feet. If you change it, it doesn't correct it for you, okay? If you started out in meters and you wanted to correct it to feet, then that's no big deal. But, you know, you can't switch midway when you made a mistake. And then, of course, you can determine how you want to do your passage dimensions. So once you have all of this stuff set up, and notice here I was telling you about the help, where it will bring up a little help window and explain to you how to do the different things within the help screen or within the application or the part that you're trying to do. And I find this to be really helpful because I don't have to jump out of my software. I can just look it up right there. So then when I'm done with um, the edit settings and the survey calendar, this is just you know your date. When, you, when did you survey something? And you would have already put that in under survey date, I believe. So. When we're done with this, then we're ready to go start adding some data. And I already picked a file that has data in it, obviously. Um, be aware that, that Compass reads all of these as it's case sensitive. So if you enter things all in capital letters, and then you try to tie in, you do a tie-in station with lowercase, Compass is not going to recognize that as the same um, station. So you know, keep that in mind when you enter data. Um, and what you do is you just you start entering your data, and when you get, say, to here, what it does is it automatically keeps numbering for you. Okay, This is great as long as your survey is in a straight line. So you also want to pay attention if, you've gone, if you're going to go back to, say, like a splay shot or someplace. You want to make sure that you're starting at the right station. So you don't want to start adding data, you know, adding errors to your data when you don't want to. Um, before I go up there, this is where you would put the survey flags. And what the survey flags are is you can tell Compass to either um, don't count this station in the survey total. So if you've taken a lot of splay shots, you don't want to include all of those in the survey total, and you can flag those to not do that. If you have a surface survey, you can flag it so that the surface line doesn't show up on the plot. And so let's see if I can find set flags and I go to help and basically this tells you you know the different things that you could flag for and so it comes in handy if you want to do that what you can also do is you can add comments next to each one of your stations maybe it's a lead maybe there's some interesting biology or some interesting geology there and you can include all these comments um, and so those are kind of those are real helpful so we're getting to the point where we want more from our survey besides just numbers. Okay. So what I'm going to do with this is, well, so what you have up here is you have ways to basically deal with your data. So for instance, 
if um, I wanted to delete this shot, I want to make sure that I'm on the station that I want to delete. I say delete, and it's going to get rid of it. Be careful when you use that because if you're up here and that's not what you intended to delete, you know, it'll delete it. I think there might be a way for it to bring it back, maybe. Uh, you can treat stations in blocks, so you could block a whole bunch of stations, and um, you can uh, search on them. There's a whole bunch of different things that you could do. You can split your survey. You might decide, well, I have everything under you know, this day's survey, or I have everything in this book, but it's under three different days, and I want everything to be on the same day. So you can use that to split up your survey so that you know what you did on what day. Um, that may sound, if you don't have a lot of experience with CAFE survey, that might, might, might sound like a little bit OCD, but it's really not. Any information that you could put is, is helpful in the long run. Notice here where it says pass, and basically that means passage. And so what happened was is that the way that they took this station, they didn't really have a left or a right wall. And so Compass will let you put a P in there. And there's any number of reasons why you may or may not want to do that. Um, compass will only allow a left and a right and an up and a down. You could finagle it to, to, to do more so that you could show things maybe in a 3D kind of mode. But in standard format, you know, this is what you have. These are the four parameters that you have. And how you measure those, in, in terms of where you measure those, I'm not going to go into that because there's a lot of different, you know, ideas about how you do it. And, you know, I think that um, there isn't one that's better than the other. What's critical is that you be consistent in whatever you do. Okay. So, I've entered all my data. Now I want to save it. So, I go up to my handy dandy thing, save current file, and it will save this file. I could save it and name it something else. You can see there's a lot of different options of what you could do with that file. Occasionally, and this is, um, I don't know what if, if it's really a bug or if it's just an idiosyncrasy of Compass, but occasionally you will accidentally open two of the same file. I don't know how that happens. I do it on occasion myself. And I'll know that I did that because when I press uh, Save Current Survey, what it will do is, instead of saving it and disappearing, it will tell me, oh, nope, can't do that because you have another file open. And all you need to do is go down to the bottom of your screen here. And, it, you know, just like with any one of these icons, if you have more than one file open, you're going to see more than one file associated with that. And all you need to do is close the other one, and then you're, you should be good to go. So, um, and then you can go back here, and if you need to add data or make any corrections on any one of these surveys, this is, you know, this is kind of what you're, where you're working back and forth between. And so that's why, to me, I like this user interface. It just makes it easier for me to keep track of things. Okay. So I've, I've um, entered my data. I've saved my data. And now what I want to do is I want to process it. I want to, and let me close this. I want to make a line plot, but I also want to check the quality of my data as well, which it kind of does it at the same time. So I'm going to have it process the entire make file. Now, if you only wanted to look at this, then you can say process and view selected, and this is where you would use that. You can't use this um, in, the, in the mode that shows you all the different files within your bigger file. This is the only way that you could do this. So I'm going to go ahead and process the data. Also notice right here it says process options. And so it says, do you want to close your loops every time you press this button or only if they change? Or maybe you don't want to close the loop. You know, there's any number of reasons why you might want to use this. But don't ignore these little things because they could be very helpful for you. What they mean by compile is whenever you're processing the data, do you only want to compile those files that have changes or do you always want to compile them? And notice I have always on, on these. Okay, so now we're going to make a, a plot of this, and we just process and view cave. And it's, the plot's going to come up, but we're not going to look at that immediately. So right at the bottom of the screen, this tells you if there's any errors. 
And this, of course, is some miracle data set that has no errors for some reason. Um, but that's where you would, you would look at that and say, ah, well, I think I have a tie-in problem. Because what happens is if, you're, if you have a tie-in issue or something is not closing right, it, might, it won't plot it. And so you really want to pay attention to that. And then after you got to the point where, you know, okay, I see what errors I might have made. Now I want to see, like, what, what did we survey? What did we do? Here's where I get to go to the cave statistics. And I click on cave statistics. And what it will initially show is just a data summary. So that's going to tell me, you know, the length of the cave. It's going to tell me, you know, how much was actually surveyed. And it gives it to me in both units, in, in, in English and in metric. Um, number of files. You can see, I don't have to read all these two. You can see um, what it will do. The things that will not be as accurate are things like cave volume and enclosed volume. And the reason for that is because of how we survey caves. Since we only were limited in this to just four, you know, four parameters, then, you know, as you know, cave passages are not like perfect rectangles. They have all sorts of different shapes. And so in order to get a more accurate volume, there's actually another application of compass that you could use to do that. But anyway, that's just an example of, of some of that data. Highest and lowest stations. I mean, you know, a lot of this stuff is interesting to people. You could say, oh, well, the highest part of our survey or our cave is here, or, you know, the deepest point of our cave is there. And this is where you would find that data. There's also a bunch of other things that you could do, and you can see this on the stat, you know, statistic item to display. Um, you can look at your absolute station coordinates, okay, your eastings and northings, or you know, what are the loop errors, um, you know, what's in the loop. You know, you can. There's all sorts of different kinds of summaries that you could get from any one of these places, and you would just, well, it'll show you everything already processed. If for some reason this comes up blank, and sometimes it does, then all you have to do is just press process again, and it will bring up whatever that you want. So this is, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's important to, um, you know, to have good, you know, to put the data about your data in there. Because um, it's just, you know, useful information. Okay, so I put my plot somewhere, can't find it, I'll just make it again. And of course, this is what we all want to see, right? We want to see the line plot. Um, and so here we have the line plot. And one thing that you, this is another little um, kink, I guess, of compasses. When you make a plot, you need to press enter. I do not know why you have to do that. All I know is if you don't do it, then the plot does not respond <laughs> in a way that, you know, is predictable to you. And so, since I've been doing this, I've been using this software for so long, I, ha I don't even think about that anymore. So now we have a plot. What can we do with this plot? Well, these are, so let's show you some navigation first. Um, it doesn't have, you know, a nice little hand that you can move things around like you can in other, you know, software. So you got to use the arrows to move things left and right and up and down, right? No big deal. This is how you can change. There's a couple ways to change the scale, but this is zooming in and zooming out. You want to zoom out. You want to zoom in. This um, rotates your data or your line plot, and it'll rotate it in different ways. And then this, these last arrows, are going to rotate it when you're looking at it in profile view. Um, so let me get into profile view. All of these have multiple things under them, and I'm going to show you my favorite ones because we could be here for a long time to look at every single one of them, but I'll show you the ones that I like to use the most. And one of them is profile mode because I love profiles. And so the cave is in profile. It, it really truly is. And one thing, so I want to spin this around. I want to kind of look at it and try to understand the layout of the cave. And so this thing right here, this little thing here, that's the increment in which it will move, it'll rotate your cave. And so I think that might be 30 feet. It's 30 something. And so that's too much. I want to see it at smaller increments. And so here's your choices. 
You can make it go really fast or you can make it go slow. And I usually like to put it at five to start out with. And then what I can do is I can start rotating the cave around. Okay. And so now you're, you're kind of starting to get a better idea of the layout of the cave instead of thinking that you're looking at this big like bowl of spaghetti. Now your spaghetti has a little more organization to it. Um, now, one of my favorite, um, and I'll show you this first, even though it's maybe a little bit kind of advanced, not advanced to do, but just in concept, is I, I wanted a shadow box because I felt like a shadow box would help me make 3D profiles easier. Can you tell I'm obsessed with 3D profiles? I am indeed. And so what I'm doing here is, and I asked Larry, could you make me a shadow box? And he did. And so this shows the wall of the shadow box. This mirrors the line plot on the walls. And I don't put that in there because it makes it look too messy. And then um, this puts a grid on the wall. And sometimes I want a grid and sometimes I don't. But initially I say no. And then this lets you determine like the parameters of your grid. But right now I have put the cave in a shadow box. I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to look at it. And you're like, well, whoop de doo what does that tell me? Well, not a whole lot this way, except if you tip it just a little bit. And now when you tip it, you have a little bit better visualization of how your data lays out. And this is what I use when I'm making my 3D profiles, because I have to understand how thing, where the passages are with respect to each other, and seeing a line plot floating out in space doesn't really help that out. Now, um, I started playing around with Caveware, and they put a really nice grid on there that makes this even easier for me to visualize. But anyway, for Compass, this is how you do it, and, and I use this all the time. And you can, you know, tip it as much as you want. You could tip it back. You could do whatever you want to it. So that was the cool thing that you could do with that. And I'm going to take it out of profile mode and put it back, and I'm going to turn off the shadow box for now. So I want to know, like, well, what, what's, where are my stations? What are my stations? Well, you can label all the stations. And they're not going to label in a way that you like them right now. Because notice the labels are too big, but we can fix that. It will give you state labels, which you can turn on and off. It will give you the depth relative to whatever you decided zero datum was. And that's what, and what this is, this is a cave in Colorado up in the mountains. And so I believe that they, um, their zero datum is actually sea level, which is why you're seeing 10,000 feet here. <laughs> it's not a 10,000 foot deep cave. So, um, but that could easily be like, you know, 20 meters or whatever. It all depends on what your datum is. So you can turn the numbers on and off any way that you want. So now I use this preference a lot because, well, it has a lot of useful things in it. One thing, of course, that you're going to want to do is look at your settings. Um, right now, the cave, if I plot this out or do whatever, it's going to show me all the, the um, units in feet. But I can change that to meters if I want, and this is where it will do it. It'll let me change the, the, where the, the angle to display is. It'll, do I want to zoom to the center, or do I want to zoom to a corner? What do I want my scale bar to see? Do I want feet per inch? Do I want meters per inch? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Do I want representative fraction? I always say no, because that's like kind of confusing. I love meters per inch because I really know it in inches, and then I don't have to worry so much about the meters. If I'm meters per centimeter, then there's two things I have to think about. So um, for geo-referencing your line plot, you're going to have to tell it a little bit something about your coordinate system. Um, is, your, is your locational information in latitude, longitude, degrees, or is it in degrees, minutes, and seconds, or is it in UTM? Um, what is your datum? And it's got a whole bunch of different data out there. And, you know, WGS, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to our port. Is it NAD 1984 that's going to get changed or whatever? But anyway, here's your, here's your datum. And these things are important. When you want to export, you know, you want to export a geo-referenced file, you want to make sure that this is correct. If you don't address this at all, then it won't let you make that file. And you're going, what the heck? I thought I did everything. So don't forget this. 
And then, uh, I'm not exactly sure what this is. I would look at the help under normal conditions, but I'm trying to show you my favorite things, not the most obtuse things. So, you always want to make sure that the settings are as you want them. You can um, determine whether you want to label every station or do you want to label every fourth station? And this is where you would do that. Um, you know, I only want to see it every fifth station or whatever, however you want to do it. Um, this is where it will mark your stations. And this is going to fix the width of the line that it makes. So maybe you want some surveys to have thicker lines than others. I mean, you could really fine tune however you want to show your line plot in this. There's just a lot of stuff that you could do. Set legend. It's always good to have a legend, right? So this, obviously, it's your legend. It has the name of the cave. And this is going to be whatever name that you put um, in your data entry page. Okay? That's the name that's going to be on there. It'll tell you what the current um, scale is. And this, and this little tick, that's north arrow. This tells you what direction you're looking at your plot. And as you see, as you rotate it around, you know, your north arrow rotates around, too. So that's really helpful. Um, if you decide that you're going to do a cave that you want to do in quadrangles, Compass will set up quads for you, and it'll do it any way you want. There's all sorts of different ways that you could um, divide up your cave in a way to do it, you know, in a quadrangle format. And no matter what happens, no matter what, what you do, there'll always be some corner of the cave that goes on a zillion different <laughs> different sheets. But sometimes caves are just a cave is too big to show, you know, in, in its in, in other words, do you want to make wallpaper or maybe you just want to make a nice quad book? And so this is this is one way to do it. Let me turn that off. Set quads. So you can always toggle things on and off right there. Um, morphology settings. Oh, yes. Some of these I love and some of these I don't. Morphology just means the shape of the cave. So um, compass uses the passage dimension to determine if you're in a crawlway or a stoopway or a walkway or whatever. Okay. Now this is not necessarily going to be perfect, but it could kind of give you a nice little ballpark. So if you want to know, like, where's all the walking passage in this cave, you know, you can just show me and it should show you, like, in, let's see, what color do we have? It will do this. I just did this before. Basically, what happens is it will show you, it will let you color code the different um, parts of the cave so that you know, like, where's all the crawlways? Where's all the stoopways? What it won't do is it won't tell you where all the hot leads are. That's something that you have to do on your own. Okay. Um, when you're doing a profile, you're going to want a depth bar profile, right? So I'm going to turn that on real quick. I'm going to display this in profile mode, and now you can see my profile. And I can just move this a little bit closer. So now I get a bit, pretty good idea of the different elevations at which my cave is at. And notice these are all keyed to um, um, sea level and not to the zero datum entrance of the cave. But it's always handy. Well, you should have a scale on no matter what you know, angle you're showing. So let's put this back to profile mode. Um, this is one of my favorite passage wall modeling. Ooh, what does that mean? So what you can do is you can, well, let's just play around with some of these. You can, um, I want filled here, and this shows up better if we show it in profile. So let me set it up in profile view again. All right, so now what I can do is start to get a sense of the 3D, the 3D-ness of this cave, okay? And so I can look at it um, with filled polygons. Maybe I want shaded cylinders. We'll show that's a shaded cylinder. Let me move this over a little bit. Um, you can show o open lines, which I don't really like that much, but, you know, somebody must like them because otherwise why would they have made it, right? Um, you can fill these. You can show nice... So as you can see, you can use this three this modeling thing here to kind of give you a sense of the three-dimensionality of your cave. 
Now it's not going to be perfect because of how we survey caves, at least with our standard instrumentation. You know, there'll be a time when this, you know, we won't even use this anymore because we'll be walking around with, you know, instant LIDAR in our, like, hands or on our heads, or, and it'll make the map of the cave as we go in three dimensions. But based on the um, passage dimensions that we have right now, that's what we have. And it keeps beeping at me because I have this window open. Um, you can do something called set complex. And what this does is it lets you color code the line plot any way that you want. Um, and, I, and when you do that, it takes away your 3D-ness there. And so you can say you want to color code the cave by, let's just say by depth. All right. So now it's color coded it by depth. And um, there you can fig, you know, you can see what this, there's somewhere, I don't know where it is. Um, where it will tell you blue is this depth, green is this depth, whatever. And you have total control over how fine you want these increments to be. You can maybe do it by date. You know, what parts of the cave were surveyed first? How far is my passages from the entrance? Or, you know, color by survey. These are all things that, you know, you might think, well, why would I want to do any of that? Well, if you play around with data long enough, you'll figure out that there's lots of things that you kind of would like to do. Um, now, when you're making a really complicated um, cave map, all right, and this one is not too bad, but, you know, it does, it does look like spaghetti, and so how would I fix that? So what you can do is, in the profile view, you can, you can pick out exactly what part of the cave that you want to see in profile. And then what it will do is it will only plot that out. Maybe you don't want all the cave. You don't want you. Maybe you only want something on one side of the cave. This is something that you'll do when you get into caves that are really, really mazy and really complicated. This allows you to isolate different parts of the cave so that you can, um, you know, either plot them out better or you know understand them better. But this gives you a lot of latitude to do that. What other preference do I have that I like? Um, this color and fonts, sometimes, you know, like I, I don't like these yellow colors at all. These things drive me crazy. So anything that's written that's in a font, you can change the color. So you just highlight, you go to fonts, you highlight it, you go to where it says edit, and I want, let's see, it's going to show me the survey stations, not what I'm looking for. Station labels, station, ah, depth bar labels. There we go. So the depth bar labels are this blinding yellow, and I would really like them to be something that didn't hurt my eyes. And so I'm going to pick maybe a nice silver gray. Okay. And so now when I put them up there, it changes them. And you can do that with the station labels, with everything, anything that's on this list, you can change the the font and you can change the color. You can also change the physical properties of the plot. You can make the background color black. Sometimes your plot will stand out better if it's black. Um, if I'm working, if I'm going to do like cartography related stuff, if I'm going to make a line plot or whatever, I like to look at it in white. If I'm going to display it, you know, for like a presentation or something, then I'm going to make it black. And all these different pieces here, you know, you have control over how you color all those different pieces. And so that's, that's kind of nice. And then um, if you've gone through all the trouble of customizing this the way that you want, then you really should say save user settings. And then what it will do is it will save the line plot. It will ask you to name it. And when you open that named line plot again, everything that you did, it will, it'll, it'll recover it. If you don't, then every time you uh, get out of the line plot, it will start you at ground zero again, <laughs> which may not be what you want. So preferences have, has a lot of really good things um, for showing the cave and for helping you to understand the cave. A lot of this other stuff, if you want to put a little 3D compass in there, and then when you rotate the cave around, the little 3D compass will also rotate. And you get to get your view angles pretty nicely. Um, this is another one where I have not really used this, you know, I've used some things to access and ignored other things. Uh, you can measure distances and angles between stations. 
You can actually rotate your line plot and make a movie out of it. You can record it. Um, you can make, uh, I like this, being a geologist and all, you can make um, rose diagrams. And what that shows you is it's going to show you the predominant direction that any cave trends in or what all the different passages trend in. And this might be a really good exploration insight as well to know that you know your caves in this area tend to trend in a certain way. Um, so there's you know all sorts of little tools here that you know we don't have time to go through all of them, but it's a matter of playing around with them. And you know I play around with them, see what they they do. We already looked at you know display, and some of these are redundant. Right again, display is the same as. Um, uh, plot by, you know, the complex cave plot, same thing, just in a different place. Um, here's your action where you can change the scale of your map. You can also change your, the vertical ma uh, magnification is really vertical exaggeration. And um, if you have a really, really horizontal, flat, flat cave, sometimes putting a little bit of vertical uh, exaggeration on it is helpful. Um, it doesn't, it's if you don't know that it's, you have to indicate on your map that it's vertical exaggeration, because otherwise you're like, man, look at the depth of that cave, when really it's like, it's got a vertical extension or a uh, um, magnification of 10, which is like not what you want. So there's other ways that you could play around with the display. Uh, what else? And here's where you would save it as your name, you know, and whatever you want to name it, save plot file. Um, now, these are, this is where you go to get your different map output. And they have a printer set up. I haven't used this in a while because I don't usually print maps from here. But this will let you determine, like, or indicate which printer you're going to use or you're going to make it into a PDF. Okay. So, you know, some of this stuff is, is outdated. Some of it is not. Um, it just depends. You know, things change so quickly. You can... What size paper am I going to put it on? Do I want it landscape or portrait? You know, that's what print tells you. Um, bitmap, that just pretty much you can add a dip bitmap, but you can also exp um, export it as a bitmap too. So let me see these other things. This export feature right here is kind of important. Um, if you just want to save a screen image, you like the image on your screen, it's everything that you want. Then you can click on Save Screen. Oops, I think I'm in the in the wrong one. Then what it will do is it will either make you a bitmap, or it will make you a meta file. Okay, and so um, you can change the 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 width of of the lines. You can you know any number of things. It tells you how big your file is. That might be a good idea sometimes to know. And it will, and meta files is something that I've used more than bitmaps, although I, I use them less and less too. But those options are there. And of course, the one that, that we're going to use a lot of is this export 3D and 2D formats. And you have to have a geo referenced plot in order to export it as a 3D format, okay? Because it's going to go into something um, that, that is you know, a geospatial kind of entity. So if you start with, let's see, if you want to, I want to put my stuff in, in, in Google Earth, okay, well then I'm going to make a KML. And it's going to want to know a little bit of information about your datum. You want to make sure that this matches what you said it was in your plot. Um, I always put it clamped to ground because otherwise it puts it in a weird place. Um, but what it does is it takes the line plot and it lays it on top of Google Earth, okay? It doesn't put it under Google Earth, it puts it on top of it. And for all practical purposes, that's just fine, okay? I mean, you just want to see where the cave is. Um, you can either export polygons, in other words, you know, the 3D model of your cave, or maybe just the survey line. And then you export the KML. If you don't have the right geospatial data, it's going to tell you, I, you know, you need to do something, I can't export this. Um, wall settings, this is just how it wants you to deal with a 3D model shape of the cave. So I, you don't spend a lot of time on that. DXF export, um, this is something that any drawing program can use a DXF file. You have to be careful though because 
when you and, and at first I was like I was trying to export DXF files I would bring them into Illustrator and then what would happen is is that it wouldn't come in at the scale that I identified it as and I was like what's with that you know is what's compass doing to my data well as it turns out it's not compass but it's the drawing program and so if you're going to be using DXFs whatever your um, whenever you decide you're gonna whatever program you're gonna use when you open it make sure ahead of time that you make it big enough size-wise your work area size-wise so that this fits in it otherwise it will try to adjust the size of what you brought in and then that's what changes the scale so compass doesn't change the scale it's the software that changes the scale uh, this is for you know for VR, VR uh, video kind of maps and you know you have all sorts of things that you could do to control how they look and then of course if you're going to work with anything ArcGIS or any GIS you know um, this will make you a shape file and typically if you make a three a 2d shape file that's probably fine for all practical purposes if you're going to use something like um, Arc scene where it actually plots things out in 3d then you want to to make a 3d shape file and you would export that and as long as all of your coordinate system data is correct it will export things without any problem if there's conflicts in your in your coordinate system or you haven't identified it then what it's going to do is it's not going to um, plot it out for you and it's going to say you need to fix something you know I can't do it so that's just kind of a, a quick and dirty of, of um, many of the things that Compass will do. When I export these days, when I export plots for, for cartography, I don't use this anymore. Compass has another application called SVG, and it's just called SVG. And what it will do is it will take your line plot and it will make it into an SVG file. And for just for a plain old uh, cartography line plot I don't really need it to be an SVG file but if you're gonna do round tripping that's what round tripping needs and so it will actually make you a round tripping file should you want to do that um, so I'm gonna get out of this real quick and see if I can go back to can everybody see this PowerPoint can you see is everybody speaking? yes okay yes. So the last thing I'm going to go over is just a couple of other things of the many applications that Compass has. And these are things that I've used um, and I found them to be really useful. And one of the things I love is this thing called map to dat What the heck is that? Well, sometimes you have a paper map and you don't have any data. And you could, yeah, I'm going to go resurvey the cave. Well, you can't always resurvey the cave, you know, or you can't resurvey it like immediately, but you really want to know where your cave is. And so what you can do is you can scan your line plot, you can bring it into this map to dat. It allows you to set up a scale, and then what you do is you use your cursor, and it's like you're mapping the cave. You just bring that cursor, and it'll make a survey line, just like you see that little survey line, and it'll start recording the survey data. Okay, and so now it's only giving you a plan view, but you can also do a profile too if you wanted to do it in a profile. So I have found this to be a really useful way to um, get a line plot when I needed one and all I had was a map. Enough said about that. Um, this is another thing that I don't use this a lot. I don't have to really use it a lot, but people like to morph their sketches. Um, the way that, that Caveware morphs your sketches is pretty awesome since it will also do it in 3D. And this doesn't really do it in 3D, but it's still... You know, it takes your line plot, you put in your scan sketches, and then it will tie in your st uh, stations to the stations on your sketch. And then what you have, in essence, if the sketching to scale was really close, it was really good, then you will have a map that's ready for you to start drafting. You don't have to, um, you know, make any, I mean, it's ready. You don't have to do any interpretation at all. So there are some people that are so ultra good sketchers that their stuff lines up with the line plot. I'm not one of them and there's a lot of people that aren't and that doesn't mean that we don't use morphing well I don't use morphing I just basically try to I, I'd morph it on my own um, because sometimes if things are really off then the morph sketch really gets deformed and it looks totally bizarre and it's kind of unusable 
So that's, you know, the reason why you do want to try to have, uh, if you're going to use morphing, you want to try to have as, as accurate a sketch as possible. Um, I like uh, rose diagrams. This will give you a 3D rose diagram, which is cool because now you know where, on what elevation levels your major passages form on. You know, and that's not just something of scientific interest, that's something of exploration interest. So I thought that that was, that was a pretty cool application. And then this is another thing that, that um, I had asked Larry to do, is that we were doing some work for some major oil company who wanted to know more accurately what the volumes of these caves are and what's the porosity of the rock and blah, blah, blah. And that was not something that you could easily do with um, the way that we survey the caves and with our line plots. And so we had to do a little bit of tweaking on it. You can still bring in a regular line plot and what it will do with something called convex and concave hull is it will actually calculate, you know, a pretty reasonable um, volume of cave. You know, the cave volume is hard because cave passages are irregular. And so, you know, it's like, how do you calculate the volume of something so irregular? And it doesn't do it perfectly, but it gets a lot closer than just doing it, you know, straight with the with the um, compass program. And it will also break it out on these little levels. There's all sorts of cool things that you could do with this. Um, and it's called, well, basically you have to have the Cave XO application, which is, you know, free with all the other applications that I showed you that were free. And um, what this does is it works with your line plot. And so it makes this with your line plot. So these are just a few of the, you know, myriad of applications that are out there. There's even a poor man's GIS where you can actually take like an Excel spreadsheet, have a bunch of inventory data on it, and ultimately convert it into something that you could bring into Compass and say, well, show me where all the, you know, show me where all the barite crystals are. And if you put that in your database, it will show you on your plot. You can also um, bring in topography. There's, there's, like I said, there's a whole list of different applications that are associated with Compass. You don't need to use all of them, but if you start playing around with, you know, if you're looking at your cave and your cave area in a more holistic way, then there are a lot of these things are really, really helpful. So um, I can't believe if I talk for an hour. Oh my God, I talked for an hour. Um, so. That's pretty much my quick overview on Compass, and if anybody has any questions, I don't know all the answers, but I might know some, so, you know, feel free to ask.